Alright, so today we're talking about 4.3, the definite integral. Uh, so let's go ahead and define it first. Um, so remember um, when you're looking for the area under a curve from A to B, we can estimate that using uh, n rectangles or let's see, k equals 1 to n uh, that's the height of our rectangle, and I don't want to specify that, so I'm going to write it as f x k star, and then times our dx, delta x. <coughs> and so this is the area under this curve using uh, n rectangles. And then if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, right, that, become, that makes the area exact. And so this quantity right here is also known as the definite integral from A to B, right, of f of x. And then the delta x becomes a dx. Okay, and so this is the definition of the definite integral. Okay, and so uh, the integral sign here is an elongated s. And so that's the... Um, you can think of it as taking the place of the sigma. Uh, the a is the lower bound, and the b is the upper bound. And then the f of x itself is called the integrand. Okay, uh, the dx also uh, plays a role, it's telling us what the variable is that we're integrating with respect to. So what is the variable? Okay, so it's important to have all the pieces together, and so we'll have lots of examples of how to put together the uh, the integral there. Okay, and so uh, how does the integral work if you have a positive number and a negative, or positive and negative values of your function? So if you have a function that looks like this, right? Uh, well, the way this would work is if this is area A1, so if that's a positive number, and if this is area A2 as a positive number, and this is area A3 as a positive number, right, then the integral from A to B, this is your f of x here, A to B, f of x dx, will be the area A1 minus the area A2 plus the area A3. That was just like we were doing with our uh, Riemann sums before. Good. Um, so, if you want to find the area of this curve, right, you would need to find the areas a1, a2, and a3. Okay, now, how do we, how to evaluate uh, this definite integral here? Well, sometimes we can actually evaluate it using this definition. But sometimes that definition is hard to use. This is called the Riemann sum, by the way, just uh, as a reminder. Um, but sometimes we can get lucky. We can use uh, geometry. So sometimes we can use geometry to do this. You know, for example, uh, you might have a triangle or a circle, or you might be able to use a uh, rectangle or something like that. Um, and so that's uh, activity 4.3.2. We've already done several of these, so I'm not going to repeat that here, but it's activity 4.3.2. Okay, and that's all uh, just using, again, geometry to uh, evaluate the definite integral. I should also state that we're going to always assume that our function f of x is continuous on the integral from a to b. Uh, otherwise, you can run into some trouble. Um, other classes, you'll be able to talk about that. Uh, Calc 2 in particular is going to talk about lots of different techniques for evaluating this quantity here. Uh, so for us, we're just going to look at some real basic ones. Okay, 
So, oops, I think a lot of bleed through there. How about section, uh, or the next part here, uh, properties of the definite integral. Okay, so the first property is that uh, if you take the integral from a to a of f of x dx, you just get zero. Geometrically, what are you doing? You're computing the area under a single point, right? And so in the Riemann sum, what you're doing is delta x, oops, delta x, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> let me rewrite that, delta x, which is b minus a over n, just becomes a, over, a minus a over n, and so that's equal to zero. And so in your Riemann sum, all you're doing is, so oops, I see I went off the page. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so you're just taking the area under a point. And so uh, if you take a look at your delta x, that's just zero. Okay, uh, two. <clears throat> you can break up an integral. So if you have a function uh, from a to b here, and you can pick any value of c in the interval, so maybe c is there, then that you can break up your computation so that the integral from a to b, f of x dx, is equal to the integral from a to c, f of x dx, plus the integral from c to b, f of x dx. So you can break up the area into this piece and this piece. Good. Yeah, it's... Um, it actually works for any C. C doesn't have to be inside the interval, but uh, it's probably easier to imagine, you know, why you would break it up if C is actually inside the interval. So, okay, uh, what happens now if our bounds are swapped? So, what's the relationship between A and B and B and A here? F of x dx. Well. Um, probably the easiest way to see the difference is that in this case, you know, our delta x was b minus a over n, and in this case, your delta x is equal to a minus b over n, right? And so in this case, it's the negative of this one, the delta x term. Okay. And so, um, when we're computing our Riemann sum, this ends up being the negative of that. So, the upshot is, is that if you flip your bounds, uh, you get the negative. So, for example, if I had, uh, oh, let's say, uh, 3, uh, 1 to 2 f of x dx, that's the same as minus 2 to 1 f of x dx. So you can play around with the uh, bounds like that. Okay. And finally, uh, there's a couple of rules that kind of go together. And, oop, maybe I'll pause and, and write them down real quick. Okay, so a couple of quick rules here. In this case, this is uh, very similar to that derivative rule that we had. If you take the, so the, just as a reminder, if you take the derivative of a constant times a function, it's a constant times the derivative of the function. Well, in this case, we're taking the integral from a to b, that looks like a 3, that's a b. From a to b of a constant times a function, you can just factor the constant out of the integral. And then it's the constant times the integral from a to b f of x dx. Similarly, if you're taking the integral of a sum, you can break that up as the integral of the first function plus the integral of the second function. Good. So, just as an example of where this comes into play, if you're taking the integral from 1 to 5 of 3x squared plus 5x, uh, let's say minus 2 cosine of x, 
dx, right? This means uh, the first rule says that you can break this up into a sum, 1 to 5, 3x squared dx, plus the integral from 1 to 5, 5x, minus, uh, oh, I guess I'm using my ruled early, that's fine. Oops, I forgot my dx. Don't forget your dx term. 1 to 5, 2 cosine of x. Good. And then you can pull the 3 out, right? And so then you just get the x squared dx plus 5 times the integral from 1 to 5 of x dx. And then the minus 2 integral from 1 to 5 cosine. Okay, and then in the next section we'll figure out how to evaluate those. Good. And I believe those are all the properties that we wanted to look at in this section. Uh, <clears throat> oh, there's one more, the average value. Um, for the average value of a function, you know, if, if you have a bunch of values, let's say uh, y1, these are just numbers, y2 up to yk, for example, then you can find the average by taking the sum of the y i, right? And then you divide by k, so that's the average. Well, uh, if you have a f continuous function, you can actually replace the sum by the integral. Divide by the length of the interval, interval, and that is the average value of f. Okay. Uh, yeah, once again, uh, I don't want <clears throat> to go too far with the, uh, with these formulas until we actually have a good method for evaluating these, but we'll get one here, uh, shortly. So in the exercises, uh, we're going to play around with some, uh, some of these quantities, and so we can take a look at a couple of those. Oop, I think I'll, uh, stop this video and... Uh, get a different video for the examples from the exercises.